Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for February's version of Literature Out Loud, which is brought to you by Pitkin County Library, but made possible by the fabulous people at Thunder River Theater in Carbondale, Colorado. We've got a couple of really nice pieces written by a man named Simon Rich, who as a young man, probably in college, started writing for Saturday Night Live. Hey! start at the top. But he has written several books now of his short stories. And from looking at them, you will see that not only has he got a really twisted sense of humor, but he also has a soft spot in his heart for children and is now a father himself to a very nice little girl. So the two pieces I am bringing you to tonight are voiced by two beautiful readers, Mitch Slevick, from Denver. There he is. And Lee Sullivan, that you know from the Thunder River Theater Company and from the Roaring Fork Valley. Mitch will be reading Animals, which was written, I think, before Simon had children, but was totally aware of how much he loved them. And Learning the Ropes by Lee Sullivan, which was written after Simon had had his little girl. I think that will be painfully obvious to all of you, but also beautifully obvious. So I won't talk to you in between times, but I'll talk to you at the end. And please enjoy as much as I will these readings by Mitch and Lee of the words by Simon Rich. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. They buried my wife in a shoebox in Central Park. I like to imagine that her funeral was respectful, that her body was treated with a modicum of dignity. But of course, I'll never know. I wasn't invited to the ceremony. Instead, the guests of honor were the students of Homeroom 2K, her killers. When the children return from the burial, they do tributes to my wife and magic marker, maudlin scribbles of halos, wings, and harps. It was hard not to vomit as Mrs. Hudson taped them up above my cage. I've never seen such tasteless dreck in all my life. Haley, I noticed, was crying as she drew. The irony. It was her responsibility to refill our water bottle last week. Instead, she spent all her free time with Alyssa practicing a clapping game called Miss Mary Mac. Miss Mary Mac, 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 all dressed in black, black, black. It was that inane chant that provided the score to my wife's final moments. She was dying of thirst, but never cried once. It was only later I realized why. Her body was too dehydrated to produce tears. Pocahontas was her name. My name is Princess Jasmine. I am a male, so this name is humiliating. But I'm aware that my situation could be worse. The other homeroom, 2R, has a guinea pig named Stimpy and an elderly turtle named New Kids on the Block. Pocahontas left me with three sons, and it's for their sake alone that I keep up my struggle. Every weekday morning, when the monsters run screaming through the door, I hide my babies under scraps of newspaper. Whenever food and water are scarce, I give them my whole portion. Their faces are exact replicas of my wife's. And when I look at them, it helps me remember just how beautiful she was. Their names are Big Mac, Whopper, and Mr. T. Mr. T was born with developmental problems. He was so small during infancy, we had to shelter him each night, wrapping our bodies around his shivering frame so that he could fall asleep. I've been through a lot. If I lose Mr. T, I'm not sure I'll have the strength to carry on. It's morning now. The square of sunlight on the blackboard grows and grows. Soon the gremlins will run in howling, hopped up on Pop-Tarts, and primed for violence. For months, I assumed that the school was reserved for juvenile delinquents. But during parent-teacher night, the mink coats and bespoke suits told a totally different tale. Turns out this school is a private one, an elite institution for the children of millionaires. I can hear the nannies muscling their way through the lobby, dragging their little terrors towards my family. My sons are still asleep. I lick their faces and conceal them as best I can. The bell clangs harshly. The nightmare begins. Monday, 8.25 a.m. What time is it? Jobs time! My fur bristles as Miss Hudson takes out the jobs board. This laminated poster with its 17 colorful squares rules my family's existence. It determines everything. 
whether we feast or starve, live or die. I rub my paws impatiently while Miss Hudson assigns this week's tasks. Pencil organizer this week is Dylan. Line leader is Max. And our two table wipers are Kristen and Sophie. Eventually, she gets the one job that matters. Hamster feeder is... I scan the room. There are still some good candidates left. Maybe we'll luck out and get Caitlin? Last month, she gave us double portions. If her name is called again, Mr. T might gain some weight in time for winter. It's while I'm enjoying this fantasy that Miss Hudson clears her throat and with one little word sentences my family to death. Simon! My eyes widen with horror. Simon Rich is 2K's class clown, a pudgy, hyperactive boy with some kind of undiagnosed emotional problem. Hamster feeder, he shouts. What you talking about, Willis? The other children laugh hysterically. My God, I think this is it. This is how it ends. 11.25 a.m. Free time's almost over, Miss Hudson says. Don't forget to do your jobs. I sigh with relief as Simon finally waddles to our cage. He doesn't feed us, though, or replenish our water. Instead, he picks me up by my tail, which is connected directly to my spine. The pain is so searing, it shocks me into a kind of perverse laughter. I did not know my body could hurt this way. That God would allow one of his own creatures to suffer on this level. Simon swings me through the air while singing nonsensically in his high-pitched nasal voice. <clears throat> I glance at my babies, hidden safely under newspaper. Even at the peak of my agony, I... <clears throat> I am grateful that Simon has focused his sadism on me. Otherwise, it might be them who suffered. Free time ends, and Simon drops me back into my cage, from several times my own height. My sons poke their heads through the newspaper. They look around confusedly, then stare at me in dismay. They're used to receiving food at this hour, but I have none to give. Simon has forgotten to do his one basic task. There's still some water left in our bottle from last week, but all I can do is prolong our agony. Without grain, we won't live long. 2.30 p.m. During scientist class, Mitz Hutton unveils a large glossy map of the solar system. There are nine planets, she says. Which one do we live on? Mars, Simon shouts. The other children howl uproariously. This is what passes for wit among them. The basic substitution of one word for another. Very funny, Miss Hudson says, smiling indulgently. But of course, we really live on Earth, the third planet from the sun. Mars is the fourth planet. And after that one comes Jupiter, Saturn. I sigh with misery. It's obvious what's about to happen. Uranus? There's a split-second pause, and then the class erupts into full-fledged mayhem. I try to shield my sons from the noise, but it's too late. The monsters have heard a dirty word and cannot contain their excitement. Uranus, Simon exclaims. Your anus! <clears throat> I lock eyes with the teacher, silently willing her to beat him. But all she does is walk across the classroom and turn off the fluorescent lights. Her strategy fails. The children's laughter grows so deafening that I can feel my eardrums throbbing in my skull. Some of the students are standing on their desks, swinging their arms around in some kind of mania. Chaos gradually subsides, but only because the children grow exhausted. <clears throat> the utterance of the word anus has produced in them pure ecstasy. Several of them are crying real tears. Miss Hudson turns the lights back on, and I glance at the clock. The Uranus episode has lasted 13 minutes. Before the lesson can resume, the bell rings. The spoiled brats run laughing through the door, another day of foolishness behind them. <clears throat> I watch as my children drink our last remaining drops of water. We'll be lucky to make it through the night. Tuesday, 8.15 a.m. I wake to the sound of screeching laughter. <clears throat> Sophie and Alyssa have made a dress out of pink construction paper and taped it to my sleeping body. You're a pretty girl, Princess Jasmine, Alyssa says. A pretty, pretty girl. <clears throat> I try to remove the costume, but the tape is double-sided double and my paws are too weak to detach it. I must wear this dress indefinitely. In the presence of my own sons, <clears throat> I avoid their eyes and they avoid mine. Whatever dignity I had left is surrendered. During attendance, everyone says, here, except for Simon, who says, not here. Somehow this gets a laugh. For the first time in my life, I think seriously about the option of suicide. 
Miss Hudson starts the day with a geography lesson. She spends 10 minutes explaining the concepts of north, south, east, and west. Then she asks the class which country is north of the United States. The children stare up, her, stare up at her, completely baffled. Eventually, Jeffrey raises his hand. Uh, Mexico? He guesses. The teacher smiles at him encouragingly. Almost, she says. I watch in stunned silence. She hands the little moron a sticker as a reward for trying his best. What do we say, Miss Hudson asks the other students, when someone tries their very best? The children smile and break into a chant. That's all right. That's okay. We still love you anyway. I vomit bile onto my own legs. I've heard a lot of treacle in the classroom, but this new cheer is so cloying it pushes me over the edge. The children continue to chant, their voices growing louder and more confident. It's no wonder they're such monsters. They've been taught that they're infallible, as perfect and blameless as gods. You forgot to feed the hamsters and brought about their deaths? That's all right. That's okay. We still love you anyway. 2.30 p.m. During snack time, Simon and three other obese boys have a milk drinking contest. It's hard to watch as they gorge themselves just inches from my starving children's faces. Mr. T has begun eating newspaper to dull the pain in his stomach. My other sons sleep all day to conserve energy. For the first two days of our ordeal, I fantasized constantly about food. I hallucinated mounds of grain, piles of nuts, and luscious chunks of apple. Lately, though, I've stopped feeling hungry at all. It's as if my body has given up and braced itself for death. Teddy wins the milk drinking contest by downing seven cartons. He immediately throws up. Miss Hudson sends him to the nurse and calls for Carlos, the janitor. He arrives within seconds, carrying a tattered mop. Hola, the children shout in unison. Carlos is a native English speaker, but the little racists assume that he is foreign born. Hola, Carlos says. I need you to take care of something, Miss Hudson tells him, gesturing at the pile of vomit. Carlos nods and gets to work. He's still scrubbing 20 minutes later when the final school bell rings. Adios, the children shout as they run by him. Adios. Adios, he says, his eyes on his work. Miss Hudson peeks over his shoulder, her skinny arms folded across her chest. Are you going to dis disinfect the area, she asks. Carlos forces a smile. He has already begun to disinfect the area, but does not want to contradict her. Yes, ma'am, he says. I don't want that smell hanging around. Of course, ma'am. When all the children are gone, she puts on some lipstick and changes into a pair of high heels. My dad's making me see opera, she complains. Carlos nods awkwardly, unsure of how to respond. Don't forget to disinfect the area, she repeats on her way out. Carlos finishes mopping and then walks from table to table, cleaning up after the fat beasts. The jobs board is a total farce, I think, as he sponges up their filth. Kristen and Sophie are table wipers in name only. At the end of the day, every job on the board belongs to Carlos. The only exception is line leader, which of course is a privilege that he will never get to enjoy. Carlos looks at our cage and curses at the sight of all our feces. I avert my eyes in shame. I know we're not responsible for our prison's deplorable conditions, but it's hard not to feel mortified. As Carlos collects our soiled newspaper, I notice he has several tattoos on his forearm, a few cursive names and a large ornate crucifix. I too am a Christian. Although lately I've struggled to make sense of God's plan, I wonder if Carlos's faith is as battered as mine. He refills our water bottle, and for the first time in days, I allow myself to feel hope. Before he can find our feed bag, though, Principal Davenport runs into the room. Carlos, there you are. A fifth grader shat himself in dance. Would you please take care of it? Carlos forces another smile and reaches for his mop. Of course, sir. The principal gives him a thumbs up. Gracias! Wednesday, 10.45 a.m. The water tastes so rich, it brings tears to my eyes. As I drink it, I can feel it coursing through my body, giving my parched veins life. I look over at my sons, asleep in their clean cage, their wet little noses twitching with contentment. Carlos has saved our lives. But for how long? Mercifully, the children are gone this morning. They've been given a break from their arduous studies to enjoy a field day at Randall's Island. The classroom is blissfully quiet until lunchtime when the hobgoblins return. Their flabby red faces are streaked with grime and sweat. The smell is almost unendurable. 
Every child, regardless of fatness, has somehow won an athletic award. Boom shakalaka, Simon shouts as he thrusts his golden prize over his head. When he walks by my cage, I peek at the engraving on his trophy. Participation, it reads. I wonder if Simon is aware that his trophy has no meaning, that all he participated in was a mass delusion. What you talking about, Willis? Simon says, and everyone laughs, including Miss Hudson. The children spend the afternoon playing with their awards. Simon comes up with the ingenious gag of holding his trophy in front of his groin in an imi imitation of an adult penis. The other boys applaud him and rush to follow his example. The girls, meanwhile, busy themselves making outfits for their trophies out of construction paper. Miss Hudson encourages this madness, passing out glue and jars of glitter. Finally, at 3.15 p.m., the nannies come to take the creatures away. Don't forget to do your jobs, Miss Hudson cries. Simon doesn't even look in our direction. This makes three days straight without food. It's official. We're going to starve to death. I glance at my sons. Their bodies still have breath, but I can see that something else has died inside them. Mr. T hasn't moved in hours. And this morning, I caught Whopper leering at him with a look I wish I could block out of my mind. Taboos are breaking down. If food doesn't come soon, I know we'll have to make our own. Thursday, 8.10 a.m. As another hellish day begins, I gather my sons around me. I've rehearsed my speech all night, but it's still hard to utter the words. Eventually, with painful effort, I manage to force the terrible edict through my lips. If Simon forgets to feed us one more time, I want the three of you to eat my body. Mr. T breaks down and weeps, but Big Mac and Whopper just merely nod. They know it's the only solution we have left. I can hear Simon's voice before he enters the classroom, as piercing and abrasive as a siren. What you talk about, Willis? His use of this catchphrase has spiked in recent days. It no longer elicits the laughter it once did. In response, Simon is taken to screaming the slogan at full voice in the mad hope that the volume might somehow restore the gag's appeal. What you talking about? What you talking about? What you talking about? He presses his face against the bars of our cage and chants the phrase again and again until the words bleed together and begin to lose their meaning. His noxious Doritos breath engulfs me and I can feel the fury mounting in my chest. I think of the sound of my son weeping and the look my wife gave me as the last bit of life left her eyes. What you talking about, Wills? What you talking about, Wills? What you talking about, Wills? I have only a little strength left, but it's enough to rise up and sink my teeth into the monster's flesh. Friday, 12.30 p.m. Words can't express how sorry I am. Safety is our top priority. I'm as appalled as you are that something like this could occur at our school. He had to get three stitches. The plastic surgeon says that the scar could be visible for months. I roll my eyes as Simon's mother starts to cry. He's just a little boy, she says. And you let him be exposed to wild animals. I glance at my sons. They're still alive, but their breathing is shallow and erratic. Our cage has been moved into the principal's office, yet they don't seem aware of the change of our surroundings. I'm considering pressing charges. Simon's mother prattles on. My lawyer says I have a real case. Simon had to take a rabies test. And, and, and when the nurse pricked his thumb, he cried and cried. The doctor said he'd never seen a boy cry like that. I smile proudly, thinking of this scene. He's going to need therapy, the woman continues. Lots of it. Is there anything I can do, asked the tired principal, to help regain your family's trust? Simon's mother turns towards our cage, her eyes narrowing. I want those animals out of the classroom. Principal Davenport nods. We'll move them to homeroom 2R. That's not enough, she says, her voice lowering. I want them destroyed. Principal Davenport clears his throat. Of course, he says. He picks up a phone and calls for Carlos, who arrives within seconds, mops in, mop in hand. Hola principal says, listen, I, uh, I need you to take care of something. I can smell the dumpster before I see it. An overflowing bin of putrid trash. My nose begins to twitch as I process all the stenches. Decomposing Dunkaroos, mold-encrusted Pop-Tarts, rancid, soggy Lunchables, and spoiled Nestle Quick. The monsters have accumulated so much waste this week. 
and now we're to be added to the pile. Sorry, little guys, Carlos says. He scans the alley to make sure no children are watching. Then he pulls a hammer from his tool belt. I lick my children's faces one last time. I know my act of rebellion has hastened their deaths, and my guilt is assuaged by the knowledge knowing that their suffering will soon be at an end. Carlos holds the hammer over Mr. T's tiny skull. My son looks up, his eyes half-lidded. I pray that he doesn't grasp the situation, that his final moments aren't consumed by fear. Sorry, little guys, Carlos says. Again, sorry. He raises the hammer high, and his sleeve slides down his forearm, exposing the tattoo. He stares at the three cursive names. Then he puts away his weapon, grabs our cage, and runs. Saturday, 11 a.m. I awake to the sight of three girl humans globbing panca gobbling pancakes and chatting rapidly. What do we name the babies? <gasps> Snap, crackle, and pop. The mommy should be Miss Mrs. Fluffy or Mrs. Furry or... It's not a mommy, Carlos interrupts. He's a daddy. He pours some Cheerios into our cage. And we're going to call him Hercules. All the girls laugh. Hercules? Why? Carlos crouches down and looks into my eyes. Because he's tough and strong, and he works long hours, even though it's a living nightmare. His daughters look at one nervous, look at one another nervously. Okay, whispers the eldest. We'll call him Hercules. Carlos clears his throat and wipes his eyes roughly with his sleeve. Good, he says. Thanks. Now finish your breakfast. Every last bite. I mean it. Learning the ropes. I am my own master and commander. I serve no king and fear no god. I would sooner cut a hundred throats than heed one order from a living man. And when I strike, I take no quarter. But there be no mercy in me heart, just cold black ice. Me cutlass is me only friend. The devil is me brother. I don't recycle. When I'm done with the bottle, I just be throwing it out. I am Black Bones the Wicked, the most evil, fearsome pirate ever known. The only man I trust is me first mate, Rotten Pete the Scoundrel. And I only trust him as far as I can keep me eye peeled on his hook hand. Rotten Pete is so rotten, he'd sell his mother for a piece of eight. He's got a black beard right up to his eyes, and he keeps it slick with dead men's blood. And one thing about him is that he be lactose intolerant, so there be certain things he can't be eating. But other than that, he has no weaknesses. And like me, in his heart, there be no mercy, just the cold black ice like I be having. For years we be charting a bloody course across the briny blue, looting every schooner fool enough to drift unto our kin. When we capture a prize, we spend all the plunder on grog and sing shanties until dawn. And then we go somewhere that be open early serving breakfast, and everyone gives us dirty looks because we be pirates and we be loud. And what makes pirates pirates? is we only ever be thinking about ourselves. Our tale begins on the delicious, a three-masted frigate, both built for shipping sugar biscuits. We'd hornswoggled the captain into crewing us by claiming we was common merchant seamen. But as soon as we sailed past the breakers, we whipped out our pistols and announced our true intentions. Ahoy, we said, we be pirates. And at this point, the crew got angry at the captain for crewing us, and he got defensive-like and said, eh, How was I supposed to know these gentlemen were pirates? And his crew pointed out some red flags me and Rotten Pete be having, like our peg legs and our eye patches, and the parrot I be keeping on me shoulder, which always be saying, Shiver me timbers, which be a pretty pirate thing to say. The captain's face turned red like, and he admitted that he probably should have been getting him some references. So anyway, we made him walk the plank along with his hoity-toity educated officers. And that's when I took out 
my treasure map. I'd won it in a dice game against Black Jack the Crazy. And it gave us directions to all the buried gold in the known world. I nailed it to the mainmast, and we gathered around and stared at it in the midday boiling sun. After some time, I cleared my throat and said, um, so does anyone here be knowing how to read? And there were groans and cursing, and I realized maybe it had been a mistake to be killing all the educated officers. In any case, with our treasure quest at a momentary standstill, there'd be nothing to do but get three sheets to the wind. So Rotten Pete broke into the captain's berth by smashing the door down with his face. And we drank up all the grog and sang shanties. And me singing the main parts and Rotten Pete doing all the harmonies. And we were working on a, um, a difficult bridge section when we heard a strange howling noise coming from the deck. It could only mean one thing. We had ourselves a stowaway. Now me and Rotten Pete don't take too kindly to freeloaders. So as soon as we heard his yapping, we loaded up our pistols with the hardest bullets we could find and went up to blow the man down. The wailing was coming from a broken crate of sugar biscuits. When some clouds parted aloft and in the white bright moonlight, we could see two little eyes peering up at us. And that's when we noticed the stowaway be a little girl. She was smaller than a seaman's duffel with a tiny freckled face and a scraggly mess of hair as wild as a clump of kelp. She wore the rags of a street urchin and her body was smeared with crumbs and bits of sugar. She'd wandered on board from the docks, we guessed, to get at all the biscuits. Now here she was, stuck with us pirates at sea. Now, I expected her to cower at the sight of us because she'd be so small and we'd be so big and also we'd be pirates. But instead, when she saw us, her lips, they stopped their quivering and she sniffled a few times and blinked away her tears. And then very slow like, she held up her arms and squeezed her chubby fists, looked me in the eye and said, up. And Rotten Pete turned to me slowly and said, Arm, I think she'd be asking you to pick her up. And I shook my head and snorted and said, Arr, and that'd be ridiculous. And Rotten Pete said, Arm, why does it be ridiculous? And I reminded him that I don't heed orders from any living man. I would sooner cut a hundred throats. That'd be like one of my main things. And Rotten Pete said, Arr, but it's not a man. It'd be a little girl. And I said, if he wanted to pick her up, that'd be his business. And he said, Arr, then I guess I will be the one of us picking her up, even though I be having a hook hand. It'd be harder for me to be lifting things. And I knew he'd be trying to be passive aggressive. But I did not say anything because when he'd be doing that, I'd just be ignoring it. And so Rotten Pete picked up the small girl, and he took her to, the, to our berth, and we wrapped her in a blanket and dried off her face. We stared at her for a while, not really sure what to do, because we'd uh, been through squalls and, uh, and, and mutinies together, been shipwrecked, been marooned and shot and left for dead. But having a kid be different. It's like... There'd be no manual for this. And then the small girl started talking. She said that she'd be three years old and that she'd be hungry for more biscuits. And Rotten Pete pulled me aside and said, oh, what do you think? Should we be giving her more biscuits? She's already been eating a lot of biscuits today. Maybe we only give her half a biscuit and also be making her say please first. And I said, what the hell is going on? We'd be pirates. We should just throw her overboard and feed her to the sharks. And Rotten Pete winced and said, oh, come on, we can't be doing that. 
I asked him if he'd be getting soft. He said, I don't know. I'd just be thinking, you know, if we toss her overboard at night, the sharks will come and they might crack the hole open with their fins. So I groaned and said, fine, she can stay aboard tonight, but there's no way she'd be sleeping in our berth. And he said, R, then where will we be putting her? And I said, R, uh, we can just stick her in the hold. And he said, R, it'd be dark down there and she will be scared and scream. And I said, R, if she be screaming, we'll hear her and go down. And he said, R, so will you go down when that happens? Or are you expecting me to go down? And in the end, we decided to be, be taking turns going down. It was a night like no other. No other I have ever lived before. Louder and more vicious than the blimeous sou'wester. The small girl kept crying and asking us for biscuits. And when we finally gave in and brought her some, she started asking both of us for dolls. Dolls! And I kept telling her, Arr, we'd be pirates so we'd be not having dolls. But she would keep screaming. And so eventually to shut her up, I gave her my peg leg and said, here, this be a doll. And that worked for a spell. But then the crying started again, and Rotten Pete went down. And when he came back, he started building something out of canvas. And I asked him what he'd be doing. And he said very quietly, Arr, I'd be building a doll bed for her peg leg doll. Because it'd be needing a bed. Like how she'd be having a bed. It'd be a part of the game that she'd be playing with her doll. And also, just so you know, the name of her peg leg doll be Peggy. So she'd be asking for Peggy. That be what she means. And by dawn, I had made up my mind that sharks or no sharks, it was time for the girl to walk the plank. So I waited until Rotten Pete was uh, snoring like, and I climbed over him and down into the hold. And when the little girl saw me, she held up her hands and said, Up! And I gave her a crooked grin. And I said, real ominous, like, Arr, I be lifting you up all right. And she just smiled because she be too young for understanding subtext. And I grabbed my peg leg from her and I screwed it back on. And she laughed and said, Peggy, spin like ballerina. And when I ignored her, she said it again and again and again. And it, until eventually I said, Ah, oh, yes, she be doing pirouettes because it'd just be easier to go along with her. And as she wrapped her little arms around my neck, I noticed that her hair had a smell like biscuits. And I wondered how much of that was the biscuits she'd be eating or how much of it would just be the way she'd be smelling, natural like. Like how some kids just be smelling sweet, like cookies. And I realized that that's probably why some parents be calling their kids cookie. Because they be so small and sweet, just like a cookie. In any case, it was time to commit murder. So I started walking aft to toss her off the poop deck. And I was almost past the main mess when she pointed and said, I see X. And I stopped in my tracks and said, Ah, what did you say? And she pointed again and said, X, I see X. And I followed her tiny finger with my eye. And that's when I saw what she'd been pointing at. The treasure map. And by this time, a rotten Pete had climbed onto the deck. And when he saw me with the girl, he squinted and said, Ah, what you be doing? And I grinned and said, Ah, just spending some quality time with my favorite little girl in the whole world. And so it turned out that the girl knew letters. And not only that, she knew all the sounds that they'd be making, like P for princess, and S for sparkles, and L be for lollipop. And using this inside information, we were able to sound out some words on the map and start to make it tell its golden tales. Sometimes it'd be slow going. The girl would tell a couple of letters. This is a T, this is an R, 
But then a seagull would land on some rigging and she'd run off chasing it. And if there be a bunch of seagulls, then she'd be getting excited and soon she'd be pretending like she'd be a seagull, saying quack, 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 and flapping her arms like wings. And sometimes it'd be hard to redirect her. But then I figured out the trick of bribing her with biscuits. Pretty soon, I had her doing letters all day long. And after a week or two, I figured out the first spot where I thought there might be some treasure, a tiny island off the coast of Malta, or as she be calling it, Mermaid Apple Lemonade Tiara Apple. So I set our course, and had me been my, 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 my men bear down. And before long, the lookout was shouting, Land ahoy! And we rowed our swift longboat ashore, and sure enough, the treasure was just where the map said it would be, right under the X. But a xylophone. And so we dug up the shiny golden coins and bit them with our teeth like we'd be doing and made fast to part. That's where we traded them all for grog. And Rotten Pete said, Arr, maybe we should be trading for some other stuff too. Things that are uh, like baby carrots and yogurts and um, things that are healthy like for the small girl. And I said, ah, she has the biscuits. And he said, ah, she can't be eating only biscuits. And he said, ah, that's going to give her cavities and scurvy. And I said, she can eat whatever she wants because she be a pirate. And that is when I told him my big plan. That's what I was going to be raising the girl in a cool way. So that she'd be ending up cool. And instead of making her follow rules like a landlubber, I was going to teach her to reject conformity and rebel against society. And also to listen to cool bands. And Rotten Pete said, Arr. I think maybe this new philosophy of yours be something we should be discussing together in private. And I said, we could be doing that some other time, because right now it'd be the time for a pirate feast. And I opened a fresh crate of biscuits, and Rotten Pete sighed, real dramatic-like, and walked back below decks. And I fed the girl the biscuits, and we taught her some jigs, and we stayed up all night laughing and dancing with no cares in the world. So we kept on sailing from island to island, scooping up a treasure and crossing the X's off our list. By the end of the month, we'd plundered so much, so much loot that the hold almost busted from the weight of it. All the gold, so much, and the carpenter had to patch the cracks with caulk. In the meanwhile, the girl, she'd be becoming increasingly pirate-like. Like, for example, she started saying, ar, a lot. Which, I'm not sure if you're aware, is a word we pirates like often to be saying. And one sunny afternoon, in between treasure maps and stops, I taught her how to whistle with two fingers in the pirate ray. And she got so good at it, I could hear her clean across the ship and it got to be kind of a joke between us. Like I would whistle, and then she would whistle, and we would whistle back and forth, and it became like an inside thing that we'd be doing. And I gave her some pirate things to wear, like a red scarf for her head, which was actually only a napkin, and a cutlass for her waistband, which was actually only a small dagger. And when Rotten Pete saw her with the dagger, he said, Arr, she'll put an eye out. And I told him to relax because that just be an expression. And he said, Arr, it is not just an expression. We both have put eyes out. It be a very common maritime accident. And it has happened to both of us and fully changed our lives. And the girl got scared like and started to hand Rotten Pete her dagger. But then I stuck two fingers in my mouth and whistled. And the girl whistled back and refastened the dagger to her waistband. And later that night, I was singing shanties in the berth. 
and I noticed that Rotten Pete was not doing the harmonies like how he normally be doing. Like, technically, he'd be doing them, but he'd really be phoning them in. And then I thought about letting it go. Because I knew if, I, if, if, I'd, be, if I'd be saying something, it would be leading to a fight. And I was just not in the mood. But then he started hitting all these obviously flat notes, especially during the yo ho hos. And eventually I just looked him in the eye and I said, Is there be something? Is there be something you'd be wanting to say to me? And he said, Oh no. Because he always be making me drag things out of him. But after some prodding, he threw up his hook hand and said, Oh, I am just tired of always having to be the bad guy with her. And I told him that it was not me fault that he'd be so neurotic-like. And he said, oh, it is not so, not so neurotic to try to give her a few rules. And I reminded him that we'd be pirates. And pirates <laughs> have hate rules. And he said, oh, I'd be aware. But she's not a pirate. She, she'd be a little small girl who needs structure and routine to feel safe. And she'd be on this ship for months and we do not even have her on any kind of sleep schedule. And then he started test, He started listing all the things that I've been doing wrong. Like how me biscuits be giving her tummy aches. And me cursing be setting a bad example. And me stories about my graphic murders be making her traumatized like. And I said, oh, or maybe you just be getting jealous because she be liking me more. But at that moment I said it, I knew that I'd be pushing things too far, but it'd be too late to take it back. So I'd just be doubling down. And from that point on, the fight just grew and grew getting darker and markier, like the waves in a mighty squall. And it got so bad, we decided to bunk in different bars that night. And of course, I know the old saying about how a captain and first mate should never be going to bed angry. But I'd just be thinking to myself, Arr, we are never going to resolve this tonight. So, we're so extremely tired. Let's just try again tomorrow, when we both be more clear-headed like. <clears throat> so I crawled out of the berth, and I climbed down to the lower deck. And that is when I see the water. It be seeping in through the hole, dripping and drabbing through the waxy ceiling. And then when I open the latch to take a look, it be rushing out so quick, uh, it almost knocks my peg leg loose. And when I peer down into the hole, I see the whole thing be flooded, and the small girl be sitting atop a keg of grog, just bobbing around, confused-like. So Rotten Pete ran down and grabbed her while I sounded the alarm, ordering all hands on deck, and we manned the pumps and boiler and bailers until dawn, with the ship listing almost to beams in. And it got so bad, the only way to keep us from a death row was to counter-flood the hold, and by the time we got the ship to sail straight, we'd be losing all our hard-won treasure, every single bit of gold sinking down to Davy Jones' locker. And it was the most painful moment of my pirate's career, not counting that one time an octopus bit off my leg. So I started cursing at the carpenter, because he said he'd caulked all the cracks, but we ended up having more holes than a dragnet. And he swore that he'd sealed all the leaks. And he said there must be some new holes. And I said, ah, well, there's going to be one more new hole. And it's going to be the one I be making in your chest when I be stabbing you there right now, real hard like. And as I said it, I knew it was not me greatest kill line. But I did it not care because I was so angry. And I took up my cutlass. I was getting ready to cleave him up the brisket when I caught sight of the small girl's dagger, the one I had given her. And I noticed the tip was smeared yellow. So I bent down so I could look her in the eyes. And I said, Ah, I am only going to be asking you this once. Were you making holes in the cock? 
And the small girl started crying. She shook her head, and I said, Arr, now you be lying about it too? That'd be even worse. And that's when I felt a hook on my shoulder, and I turned around, and there by Rotten Pete. And he says to me, Arr, just calm down. It's not her fault. And I said, Arr, what are you talking about? She just lost all our treasure. And Rotten Pete said, Arr, I, I heard about this. It be called limit testing. She be acting out because she be craving discipline. And this be what happens when the environment be too permissive like. And I said, are you be blaming me? And Rotten Pete whispered, or maybe we should be discussing this somewhere else and not in front of the small girl. And he smiled at the girl and said, Arr, me and Black, me and Black Bones just be having a discussion. Just be a healthy thing grown-ups be doing. And everything be okay. And the little girl sniffled and nodded. And I rolled me eye and said, Arr, I guess you be perfect and I be horrible. Congratulations. Rotten Pete said, Arr, I am not saying you be horrible. I am just saying that this proves she be wanting rules. And I said, that be ridiculous. She be hating rules. And Rotten Pete said, ah, or maybe you just hate giving them to her. And the whole crew went, ooh, which kind of spurred Rotten Pete to keep going. And he pointed his hook at me and said, the reason you never be disciplining her is that you be afraid that she won't love you. You are worried that she will be rejecting you, like how you felt rejected as a child. And this is why you need therapy, because this all be going back to your parents' divorce, which you never be dealing with. And I said, ah, I don't need to be dealing with anything. I'm a pirate. And he said, oh, or maybe you're a pirate so that you don't need to be dealing with anything. And the crew said, ooh, again, even louder this time. And I said, ah, I be done with this bullshit. And I told Rotten Pete that if he think I be such a bad captain, maybe I should just abandon ship. And I grabbed me duffel. I threw it in the long boat, and Rotten Pete said, Arr, don't do this. You'll regret it. And I told him I would be fine, because I'd be taking the one thing, the only thing on the ship that meant anything to me, on any emotional level. And the girl smiled at me, and I said, Arr, not you, the treasure map. And I ripped it off the main mast. And I reminded Rotten Pete that there's to be one X left, and it'd be the greatest X of all, the sight of the legendary dead men's chest. There'd be more gold in that chest than in all the other chests we found combined. And this time, I wouldn't have to be sharing it with the likes of him. And I laughed in his face. <laughs> and I lowered the longboat down into the sea because I knew his waterlogged ship could never keep pace with me. The rest of the treasure would be mine, and there'd be enough to keep me in grog for a lifetime. And Rotten Pete said, Arr, don't you see? Don't you see how you just be repeating the cycle? You be leaving us, just like how your father be leaving you. And I said, Arr, thanks for the cycle babble. Real sarcastic like. And I picked up my parrot, and we headed for the longboat. When the small girl had her, ha the small girl held up her hands, and and she said, "Up," and I told her, I wouldn't be picking her up anymore because I was leaving forever, and she was staying put. When I turned my back on her, she started to whistle like I'd taught her, but I did not whistle back. I just lowered my longboat down into the sea. And as I cut the rope, I heard her shouting down letters to impress me, saying, I know A, I know B, I know C, 
hoping she could make me stay. But instead, I started rowing because I be a pirate with nothing in my heart but cold black ice. And what makes pirates pirates is we only ever think about ourselves. How the dead man's chest was just like I had imagined it in my dreams, large and cube-shaped. And by the time I finished loading all the loot onto my longboat, the hole nearly cracked under its weight. There be doubloons and pieces of eight, and even some grog, which I drank straightway. And then I figured it'd be time for a celebration. So I sang my favorite shanty. But for some reason, it'd be sounding weird to me. So I sang it higher, and then lower, and then faster, and then slower. And then finally, I realized the thing it'd be missing was the harmonies, especially during the yo-ho-hos. I got this pain in my chest. Just like how it feels when you get capsized in a squall and you're trying to swim to the surface, but you don't know which way is up. But then I drank the rest of the grog and the shanty started sounding better. So I grabbed my R's and I set my course west for Madagascar because I'd be having a favorable gold to grog exchange rate. And it was around this time that I heard a small voice say, up and my heart swelled like when you catch a trade wind in full sail and i rummaged around the boat looking for where the little girl had stowed herself away but eventually i realized it'd just be the parrot talking and it stared at me with its dull black eyes saying up 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 and so i said shiver me timbers you know trying to get it to talk more parrot like but the bird kept saying up and I know A, and I know B, and maybe it was the grog, or the heat, or me scurvy, or me late-stage syphilis, but I started to talk back to the parrot, just like it was a person, begging it to stop, pleading with the bird to leave me be, but instead it just got louder, asking for biscuits, and blankets for Peggy, and by the time it started whistling, I turned my boat around and started rowing back east to the ship, but I was moving too slow to catch up with them on account of all of my treasure. So I hurled the heavy pieces overboard, and then the medium pieces, and then some of the little pieces too. And by the time I had the main mast in my sights, I had only a couple of pieces left. So I tossed them as well, along with my peg leg and my cutlass. <laughs> my cutlass and my scarf and my earrings and pistols and my hairpiece, which uh, not a lot of people will be knowing that I have. But I figured at this point, who cares? And by the time I got within earshot of the ship, I was naked except for my long johns. And I stuck my two fingers in my mouth and I whistled for all that I was worth until my tongue was stinging and my lungs were burning. And when I saw the small girl step out in from the darkness, holding Rotten Pete's hook for support, I shouted at them that I was sorry. And I started to cry, even though the entire crew be watching it be a whole scene. I could tell Rotten Pete was still cross at me because he'd be scowling and also he'd be aiming a pretty big cannon at my face. And then the small girl whistled at me and I whistled back the best I could with my swollen tongue. And the sound of it made the small girl laugh. And she did an imitation of my whistle. And so did my parrot. <laughs> and that's what finally got Rotten Pete to break. And I could see him smirking, even though his, even through his blood black beard. And then the little girl tugged on his shirt and whispered something at him. And he closed his eyes, deliberating like, and I knelt down on my knees. I held up my hands to him. And when the lion crashed down beside me, I grabbed onto it just like a drowning man. Since then, the girl has been on a pretty good sleep schedule. Sometimes she'd be backsliding, but in general, she'd be down by seven bells 
or at least in her birth reading. And other things have also gotten different, like, for example, instead of scouring the high seas for treasure, we mainly just stay in the Bermuda Triangle. Because even though you sometimes feel trapped there, it'd be having the best schools. We also decided to give the girl a name. At first, we thought about going with something unique like Kill Girl or Murder Head. But then Rotten Pete said, Arr, but what if she gets made fun of? Kids can be so mean, like how they be picking on me for my lactose intolerance. And I knew he was probably right, because his instincts usually be sound. So we ended up going with Kirsten, because my late aunt's name be Kate, and Pete's grandfather be Kenneth. So with the K, we sort of like uh, be honoring them both. And we made her middle name be Treasure, because she be our treasure. More valuable than any piece of gold. And also Treasure be sounding nice with her full name. Kirsten Treasure Screamface. And everything be calm and peaceful now. Except last night, after talking time, I saw my reflection in my cutlass. I barely recognized myself. My stomach be all punchy like, and my hands be soft from lack of killing. And I said to Rotten Peter, Arr, I used to be the most evil pirate we did it ever known, and now I'd be barely a pirate at all. And I confessed I no longer felt like the man that he first set out to sea with. I heed orders, I take quarter. I even recycle because Kirsten did a, a thing on it for school and now she'd be getting on me when I don't. The rotten Pete he took my hand in his, in his hook. He looked me in the eye and said, Ar, you listen to me. You are the strongest that you've ever been. And we got out a bottle of grog and sang our favorite shanties, not too loud, of course, but loud enough so that we still could be doing all the harmonies. And the yo-ho-ho -ho sounded smoother than any I could remember. We are not yet sure if Kirsten will want to be a parent, but just in case, we are teaching her the ropes. Some nights, if the moon be out and she be all done with her Spanish, we let her take the helm and steer the ship. And we hold on to the rigging while she tacks in and out of the wind, chasing her own course. And we feel just like stowaways on a great adventure, like the journey is just starting. Like in some ways, we're only just now sailing out to sea. Oh my goodness. I feel like literature out loud has given birth to a hamster and a pirate. And I'm so proud to have been part of the birth process for both of those. <laughs> Gentlemen, I got to tell you, you brought it home, baby. Thank you so much. And you know, I just love it that this guy can be so irreverent and so kind of dark and then just be so sweet. Yeah. It's yeah. it's lovely. And he has written several books and I would encourage anybody that likes to read books to uh, <laughs> look him up. Simon Rich, he's not crappy. <laughs> so thank you so much. And thank you all for listening to this beautiful reading that these guys did. And I'd like to encourage you to support Thunder River Theater, who has brought this to us, even though we weren't able to do it live at Pitkin County Library, these people at Thunder River Theater and Sean Jeffries have provided us with a, a way to bring this programming to you. And I will never, ever be able to be grateful enough. 
And last, uh, next month, I mean, April will be the last virtual programming we do this way. And in April, we'll be back live at the library, but we'll change if uh, we will be on the third Tuesday of each month at 530 in the afternoon. And we'll be there. You you can actually come up and poke me in the eye if you want to, because I'll be available. And next month, however, we are doing two of the strongest pieces of literature. They're not funny, but they're strong and beautiful by a Moroccan author named Tahar Ben Jaloun. It was inspired uh, for me by a gentleman that I know where I'm working now named uh, Said who is Moroccan, and he's going to be out of town for that reading, but we're going to have um, Abid Hassan reading On Fire, By Fire, which is a fictionalized account of the things that led up to the Arab Spring uprising. Very powerful works, translated from the French, but beautifully. And also by Tahar Ben Jaloun, Islam explained just a segment of a book that he wrote explaining Islam to children. Right. Holy moly, it's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank Thunder River enough. And gentlemen, I can't thank you enough. You have once again won big old chunks of my heart. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all next month. <laughs>